are here to worship and lift up Jesus Christ. How many of you ever come in Father's house and you do not feel that praise to God? I'll put our two hands back. Sometimes circumstance happens. Sometimes, you know, you kick the cat and the cat bit you back. <laughs> you just don't feel like praising God. Well, you know what? Can I just encourage all of us in this room, every young person, child, mom, dad, grandparent? Can I encourage you that God is worthy? But I just to say to my wife, you know, we, there's questions that we have. We always say, but God, why? And one time, I think the Spirit of God stopped me and said, why are you questioning your only source of strength and help? <laughs> I am your only source of help. Why don't you praise me instead? So tonight, we're going to sing that again. Come on, everybody. It's time to start.
because it's important. You are important, and your involvement is important in all the ministries of the church and all the ministries of the, of the, of the Word of God and the House of God and the things of God. I will say here as a senior pastor of this church, we cannot do without your help. Amen. You, you lay people, you uh, volunteers, we cannot do uh, without you. While we are responsible for the leadership, you are the hands that, that strengthen us in our ministries. And so be faithful to your ministries. Now I know all you're all wondering, what's he going to do tonight when the guest speaker didn't show up? He's going to preach. That's what he's going to do. I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to the sixth chapter of Isaiah. You say, oh yeah, that's a, a real good fallback chapter, isn't it? No, it's not. No, it's not. You find that chapter, I want to share with you a few things. And I believe that, that we, we can hear what God says to us tonight. I have been, I have been praying recently uh, the prayer that God would prepare our hearts for what He wants to do in our midst. I found myself praying, Father, bring a, a conviction to saint, sinner, and in between alike. How many understand that there are there is there are the saint, there's the sinner, and then there's the in between, the, the the casual follower of Christ, the lukewarm, the not so committed but yet identifies as a Christian. And I found myself praying, Lord, Lord, just just bring the spirit of conviction. Quite often, when we think of conviction, we we think of the unsaved coming under conviction of the Holy Spirit. When we pray, oh God, convict the sinner of their sins and, and bring them to you. And that's a wonderful prayer. And that's the cry of our heart. One of the, one of the heartbeats of, of, of this congregation is that we would see men and women saved. Amen. We, we, have one, we have one journey through this life as believers. And, 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 and the greatest occupation that we can be involved with, in, uh, involved with is, 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 is doing our part to share the gospel. I do it from mostly from the platform of this pulpit. Uh, but every one of us has the responsibility of, 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 of sharing the gospel with others. And I, 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 I found myself, even in the last day or two, just, just in this sanctuary praying, Lord, wherever people are, whatever their needs are, their spiritual needs, their spiritual needs. I know there are many physical needs, but the spiritual needs of people. Whatever level of spiritual life we are at, meet us there and take us to another level. How many would say, Pastor, I'd like to go to another level in my spiritual walk? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I believe that desire is there. But there's always, there's always uh, incredible obstacles to that desire. Sometimes it's the lack of time, sometimes it's the lack of discipline, sometimes it's distractions and, and, and busyness and all of these things. But I, I, I truly believe, church, that God wants to prepare us to, to, to take us to another level. And in order for us to go there, I think we must see His glory. Yes, sir. We have un unknowingly and unwittingly and unintentionally, we have in a way made God common. I, I believe we've made God common because of the principle I shared this morning that we are familiar. We are familiar. It, it is amazing that, that uh, uh, people, a lot of people who don't have a close relationship with God when they come into the environment of, of spiritual things, they have an incredible reverence. An incredible reverence. And yet sometimes because we're familiar, we lose that sense of the awesomeness of God amongst us. We do. And so the next few moments are probably going to be a time of, of self-examination. And in Isaiah chapter in Isaiah chapter six is, is one of the most profound texts dealing with this, this whole subject of preparing ourselves before the Lord. Isaiah chapter six, many of you know the story already, but it's a powerful reminder to all of us that uh, we need to prepare ourselves for what God wants to do amongst us. We need to prepare ourselves. 
I, 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 I preach this tonight uh, from this perspective that the church is the key to what God wants done in the world. We, we look at the world, and, and I'm, as, I'm as guilty as the next person of saying how wicked the world is, how hopeless the world is, how, how, how badly positioned the world is. And, and, and why doesn't God do something? Well, he's trying to. But he's not going to send angels. He's going to do it through the church. Yes, sir. Which means the church has to position itself in before God to, to, to allow God to prepare them and it for what God wants done. For what God wants done. When I see the violence in our city, when I see the, the um, two young men stealing $7,000 worth of jewelry from an aged woman in the hospital, I think, where have we gone? Where has our society gone? I see the, the rape. I see the, the violence. I mean, it's, it's absolutely, it's absolutely uh, almost fascinating. But you can count on Friday night and Saturday night being nights of murder and stabbings and robberies in our city. It, it's a foregone conclusion that, that uh, every weekend someone is going to get stabbed to death. You see, we're trying to control that type of violence by bringing in rules and regulations. We, we, we brought in the gun registry. Still, people are getting killed. I suppose the next thing we're going to do is register our knives. <laughs> but knives now are killing more than guns. And then, uh, one day someone will kill someone with an axe and then we'll, be up, we'll have to register our axes. <laughs> If we, if we believe that that is the solution, then that's what we're going to end up doing. But you see, axes, guns, and knives don't kill people. People do. Yes. People do. And so we have a broken, a broken society. And I believe that the answer to a broken society is a hot church that is full of the Holy Ghost and God working through the lives of people. I believe that with all my heart. And so when I see all of this dysfunction in our society, I realize it's the church. And I have good reason to realize that because I believe that God gave us the answer to that in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. That says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and, and, and turn from their wicked ways and confess their sins, then will I forgive their sin and I will do what? Heal the land. What's the land got to do with, with believers repenting? Why did God say, if my people will repent and turn back to me, I'll heal the land? I believe that much of the crisis we're seeing today is because those who profess to be God's people are not where God's people wants them. And so, in, in Isaiah chapter 6, of course, we have that incredible, that incredible revelation of God's glory to the prophet Isaiah. And I believe God wants to reveal His glory to us. I, I really believe that. I believe that God is longing for us to humble ourselves. I believe that God is longing for us to surrender ourselves. I believe that God is really longing for us to do an introspection on our lives. And say, oh God, here I am in all of my weakness. Here I am in all of my brokenness. Here I am in all of my unworthiness. Do something in my life that will translate to wholesomeness and healing for this many situations around the government. Here are the situations in, in, in Isaiah in 800 years ago. 800 years before Jesus came, rather. Uh, Isaiah, of course, is the prophet. The king that was ruling Israel at that time and, 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 and Judah at that time was, was Uzziah. I won't go through all the story, but Uzziah did great things. And, and, and God blessed his reign until he got a little uh, bit uh, dependent on himself and thought he was central to what God was doing and that he, he, he could uh, play loose with, 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 with the favor and the position that he had and with the love of God towards him. And so one day he decided to go into the temple and offer sacrifice. 
that he was not allowed to do. The divine order was that the priest would offer the, the, the sacrifice. And so he went into the, uh, into the temple and, and he offered sacrifice and he offered, uh, uh, lifted up with pride uh, and, and disobeyed God. And uh, God struck him with leprosy. And he was for many years living in a, in a separate house and his, his, his son, uh, and I'm not quite sure what his name is right now, but his son uh, reigned in cold regency with him until he died. And so when we come to the sixth chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah says, in the year that the, that, that the king Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. God could not rightly, God could not rightly declare his glory until that king had died. It was not a coincidence that the year Uzziah died, Isaiah saw the Lord. And so God's appointed king and offended God. And God could not do what he wanted to do in Israel until Uzziah died. You say, Pastor, that's, that's kind of scary, isn't it? Yes, it is. The truth is, child of God, you and I as God's people can stand in God's way. Sometimes and most always we limit God to the degree in which he works amongst us depending upon how surrendered and prepared we are in his presence. You say, is it really that important? Yes, it's that important. It is truly that important. And so Isaiah said, in the year that the king died, he saw the Lord. There had not been in recent memory such a revelation of the glory of God because sin was present in the leadership of Israel. Sin was present amongst God's people. Their hearts were not prepared in His presence as they should have been. He goes on to describe the incredible sight that he saw. He said he saw the Lord high and lifted up. And above it stood the seraphims, each with had six wings, but two covered his face, but two covered his feet, but two he flew. One cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Here we get a glimpse of the glory of God as he revealed himself in the temple. It, it had not been seen like that for maybe since the maybe since the tabernacle in the wilderness. This is now Solomon's temple. And so it hadn't been seen like that, certainly, since the time that the temple was dedicated. When, when Solomon built it and the temple was dedicated, there was incredible, I think, second chapter, of, uh, second again of, uh, of, of Chronicles, chapters 5 and 6, talk about the glory of God. One of those chapters talked about the glory of God. It had not been seen since that time. And... Uh, what we're about to read next is, is an astounding text. When Isaiah saw the glory of the Lord, he cried, Woe is me, for I am undone. Woe is me. Isaiah, who was the prince of Israel's prophets, didn't realize what kind of spiritual shape he was in until he saw the glory of God. What kind of spiritual shape are we in tonight? Well, if we were to analyze that, we would probably begin by comparing ourselves with times gone past, other churches, other congregations, other people within our own congregation, and probably we would feel some degree of contentment when we look at others' lives and say, well, we are just a little bit better than that. Or we're just as good
would ask. But suddenly Isaiah, Isaiah was confronted with the glory of God. How are we doing as individuals? How are we doing as a church when we compare ourselves to the glory of God? Isaiah was an incredible Old Testament prophet that God used mightily, mightily in, in, in the life of Israel and, and the prophecies of Isaiah are still unfolding today. And yet, at that moment when he saw the glory of God, he cried, Woe am I, for I am undone, and I am a man of unclean lips. How are we doing today? When we began to, to, to cry, Oh God, prepare us, prepare me. God, work in my life. God, help me to see where I am in my relationship with you. Are we, are we willing to say, Oh God, explore my life. Look into my heart. Look into my mind. Look into my thoughts. Look into my ways. Show me, Lord. That's a pretty serious threat. And yet I believe God is calling us to that kind of introspection so that He may reveal His glory and we might be prepared for what God wants to do amongst us. Isaiah said, I'm unclean. I am undone. And I dwell in the midst. He's speaking as a prophet there. A prophet to his own people of Israel. He said, I dwell in the midst of, of a people of unclean lips. I don't know what Isaiah's problem was. I don't know what Israel's problem was. But Isaiah certainly seemed to indicate that it has something to do with the lips. Either the language they used... Or, they, or, or it certainly had to do with, with unclean lips. And the lips speaks of, of our language. And of course, uh, but that, that's only the, the, the surface. Behind it, the lips speak what's in the heart. Uh, now we're getting to the heart of the matter, no pun intended. When he said, I, 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 I am undone, I'm unclean with my lips are and my people's lips are unclean, he was talking about the condition of their heart. And he knew by their actions that their hearts were not towards God. He knew that they were God's people. You and I, mate, we're God's people. Yes. We're the blood-bought saints of the living God. Yes. We have a reason to live. And we have a purpose for living, and we have a hope in dying. It, it is the resurrection rapture, as I'm sharing with you in the mornings. We have that purpose. We have that 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 that, that reason to live. But yet, as God's people, sometimes we lose our focus. We do. We do. The, the affairs of life, the challenges of life, the things of life, they just come at us and we begin to take them on and we begin to let them distract us and, 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 and the preacher is as guilty as this as, as anybody in the congregation. We just get caught up in the things of life. And God wants us to be prepared this way. God wants us to be prepared for this process. And God showed his glory to Isaiah. And Isaiah's response was, I am undone. I am unworthy. And tonight, no matter how God uses us, we are still unworthy of the incredible privileges and the love of God that, that God has provided for us. Now, why did Isaiah come to the conclusion that he was an unclean man? Why did Isaiah come to the conclusion that his people were unclean? Because suddenly Isaiah saw the standard. And the standard wasn't the nation of Israel. The standard wasn't the other nations around Israel. They, they, they probably did look at other nations and say, we are not sinful like other nations. Therefore, we are. But when Isaiah saw the glory of God, 
When Isaiah saw the, the awesome presence of God, when Isaiah saw the, the, the moved into the atmosphere of God, he suddenly realized, I am not worthy. And I will, I want God to show up amongst us as people. I want God to show up. I, I have no interest in just coming out here at 10.30 on Sunday morning, 10.30 on, on uh, 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 6 o'clock on Sunday evening, 7 o'clock on Wednesday, and going through the motions of the church. I'm just not interested in going through the motions of the church and feeling good because we have done these things. I want to see the glory of God. Amen. I want to see the glory of God. I want to see the power of God in action. I want to see our own life. I want God to begin with this creature. I want God to begin with this people and transform us into folk and people that know their God. Who see the glory of God and say, Lord, I'm clean and so I give myself to you. And, 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 and I want you to purge my life out. I, I, I want to a fresh anointing. I want a fresh sense of your presence. I want a fresh desire for you and a fresh atmosphere of your glory. Because folks, that's what's going to make a difference. Glory. That's what's going to make a difference. Amen. Without the presence of God on our lives, without the glory of God on our lives, we're going to come in, have a good time, and go. Come in, have a good time. If we are going to be what God wants us to be and what God wants us to accomplish, we're going to have to open ourselves up for a fresh revelation of the glory. I know, I know this is a little maybe troublesome tonight to speak like this. I really know that God wants us to hear that. I know the God my heart is God with us. Lord, the saint. The sinner and the ain't. I want, I want them to encounter God. I want them to encounter God. I want them to encounter God. In fact, there's an interesting passage of scripture, and I, I think it's around Exodus chapter 32. 33. The, the situation is that God is about to reveal himself to the nation of Israel. He's about to give the Ten Commandments. That's really the chapter here. And he, he, he gave Moses a message and said, Moses, I want you to go down and I want you to tell my people to prepare themselves. To wash their clothes and wash their bodies and prepare themselves for my glory. He even instructed uh, wives and husbands not to be intimate sexually uh, in those three days because he was coming down amongst them. You might say, is that, is, that really, is that really in the Bible? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Because God wanted his people to prepare themselves for his presence. And I wonder sometimes how prepared we are for the presence of God. How prepared are we for the presence of God in our private devotions? Mm. Or are we just waiting on church to give us, uh, our visits to church to give us our spiritual encounters? <laughs> so many of God's people live a life that says, I want to go from one Sunday to the other. With, with, I want to go to the next Sunday with last Sunday's blessing and last Sunday's encounter. God's desire for us is that daily we encounter His presence. That daily in our kitchens or our place of work just spontaneously raise our hands and the Spirit of God is just with us and the presence of God just flows out of our lives. There's, a, there's that continual encounter with God. And so what happens is that we don't prepare ourselves for the presence of God. So we come from Sunday to Sunday. And so we come in on a Sunday when the body comes together. And instead of contributing, we need to soak it up because we're empty. Give me, give me, give me. Whereas we, we, we should be carriers of the glory and of the presence of God. 
We should encounter God in our kitchens. We should encounter God in our bedrooms. We should encounter God in our offices. We should encounter God in our cars, in our place of work, wherever it might be. That presence of God, that fullness of the Spirit of God, that, that, that sense that God is here. And so, here's what happens. We, we, we come in and we're empty. Because we have not nurtured that presence of God. And, and our minds are rambling and our thoughts are, are anywhere but in God's presence. And, and we bring an attitude, an atmosphere of disrespect for the, for the presence and things of God. Not intentionally. Not willfully. But it's just part of the fact that because we come as empty vessels... We haven't encountered the glory of God throughout the week. We just come in and, and we have our own little agenda. But we feel good because we've come to church. That was Israel's. And we're God's people. That was Israel's claim. And then Isaiah saw the Lord. Amen. And all of a sudden he realized, oh my goodness, I am undone. And the people I dwell with is undone. And I, I, I the, but the cry of my heart is that we might prepare our heart for, for a visitation of God. I would dare to say tonight, and I'll be bold in this, but I would dare to say, because I pastor for 20, I'll be over 25, 30 years. Probably about 26, 27 years. And so I know that in every congregation there is a multiplicity of mixes in terms of relationship with God and, and mindset. But I, I'll bet you tonight in this, in this audience there are and we're not a large congregation, but in this audience tonight, if the glory of God show right now, you'd have the you'd have three or four different types of people. You would have one type that would get up and run. Yes, you would. I mean that. If the glory of God was revealed here now in a specific way, you would have people that would get up and leave the building. Christians. You would have others who would who as it is so new to you that you would be so inquisitive that you, you, you wouldn't really understand what's going on. You would have another group who of Christians who would really genuinely question what was going on. And you would have those, of course, who would embrace what God is doing. Yes. And it was all the glory of God. Why is that so? Because people are at different levels of relationship with all of God. The relationship is, is at different levels. Based on how much we desire God. That's a strong statement, but it's a true statement. It's a true statement. And then Isaiah did the, 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 the awesome thing. He, he confessed his sin before God. And he says, a, a seraphim flew unto him from the altar. He had a coal in the palms of his hand. And, and he touched the mouth of Isaiah. Touched his lips. And said to Isaiah, Your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is purged. In other words, Isaiah was having an encounter with God. He didn't run out of God's presence. He didn't question God's presence. He didn't say, well, I'm such a wonderful person that God chose me to reveal himself to, so i, I got to get everything God's got here now so I can go and tell the people. No, he didn't. He humbled himself before God. How we doing with that? How we do it in our self-evaluation of our relationship with God? I believe God has a plan for every individual in this building. You are critical to the eternal purposes of God when it comes to the proclamation of the gospel and the salvation of souls. You look at the pastoral staff sometimes, you probably think, well, you know, that's their job. Everybody is called by God for a purpose. <laughs> How we realize that purpose will depend upon our desire for an encounter with Him. Will depend upon our desire to, to surrender ourselves to Him. Will depend upon our hunger to have Him convict us. Nobody likes conviction. Nobody likes conviction. The sinner resents it. The saint 
sometimes struggles with it, the lukewarm completely resents it. But God will bring conviction if we will, if, if we will prepare an atmosphere for Him to work in our lives, in our church as the body of believers. Isaiah was instantly convicted. He didn't argue with God. He didn't say, but God, listen, I'm the, I'm the prophet, God. Do you, don't you remember me? Don't you understand? I'm the prophet. He didn't say that. He didn't say, well, I knew that, 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 that guy, Uzziah, I knew he was the problem around here. I'm, I'm glad God you removed him. I hope he made it okay, but I'm glad you removed him because now we can get something done around here. No, he said that. And he didn't say, first of all, he didn't say, well, the people. He said, I, I, and tonight I just feel my spirit that we, everyone near the Lord, need to look within our hearts and say, Lord, where do I stand with you? Am I in the position, God, that you can use me and use me for to bring revival to the church and bring revival to the neighbor, bring revival to the family? Lord, am I in that position? That's a sobering question, isn't it? But yet, it needs to be asked. It needs to be asked. Because you see, Isaiah, in order for him to get to that point, had to go through a process. And the process was surrender. And the process was to commit and cry out to the Lord and acknowledge. Then God came, the seraphims came, and, 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 and they, they touched his lips with the coal from all the oil. It was a live coal. Church, let me be bold. We need a live coal from the altar. We need something to set us aflame again. We need something to set us on fire again. And that something is a spill in the presence of God. That something is a is a is a, a an encounter in the presence of God where we're renovated from center to circumference. In our thoughts, in our ways, in our, in our priorities, in our lives. Because look, look. Look, let me put it this way. There's no trouble to find awesome run Christians. They, 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 they just blend in with everybody else. That's not what God is looking for. God is looking for believers who will step out by faith and surrender everything to Him and say, God, here I am, use me. Churches are populated with, with believers who just do nothing more than warm the seat and make a job for the janitor on, on Monday morning. Cleaning up the gum wrappers. The story books you bring to read while the singing goes on and while the preaching goes on and gets left behind. The little ditty stories. That's, the church is filled with that kind of stuff. But God is looking for someone who's willing to say, Lord, here I am. Here I am. I'm available. I am not that encounter with you. I want that encounter with you that will, will renovate my life and refire it and retool it and recharge it so that, Lord, I can do something. Yeah. I can do something because if you'll notice, Isaiah, after he had that encounter with God and God said, Lord, I've cut your lips, your iniquity is taken away, your sin is purged. He immediately heard the voice of the Lord. We have... You know, we have more bored Christians in the church than any other organization or organism on, on the earth. Mm -hmm. And we wonder why sometimes. It's because we, we haven't got a vision for what we're all about. The moment that Isaiah was touched with the tongue from the earth, he heard the voice of the Lord. <laughs> he heard the voice of the Lord. And the voice of the Lord said, Who will go for us? <coughs> Who will step in the gap? Who will lay themselves before me? Who will sacrifice their comforts? Who will walk in obedience to the word to, so that I can use them and my work can be accomplished? Well, God, I, 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 I'm available uh, on Mondays and on Thursdays and Sunday mornings. But if you want anything done outside of that, well, I just got other commitments. We don't say that. We just live it. We don't write that down because we want to be incriminated by it. <laughs> but, but. It's true. It's true. See, your reason for living 
is to be a partaker <coughs> of the grace of God. That's the whole reason for living. In fact, most of us think that the employer that shines our check is, is, is who we work for. No. He just pays the bills. <laughs> Seriously. As believers, he pays the bills. We are called to be lights. We're called to be salt. We're called to be the voice. We're called to be the hands. We're called to be the feet. We're called to be the love of, of a living God. Mm -hmm. Once you got saved, you got conscripted into the army of God. And the natural response is to say, Lord, whatever I can do, I'm willing to do it. Anointed with money, anointed with power, anointed with the Holy Spirit. Help me to do it. And Isaiah, this is what Isaiah said. He said, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Well, I know the other prophets that I've been training. Would you send them, please? If that's in your book, you've got the wrong version. He said, Here am I, send me. How many tonight I prepare to say, Lord, here I am. All of my wrinkles, all of my scabs, all of my scars, and all of my wounds, and all of, of all that makes me up. Here it is, Lord, whatever you can use of that, use it. God says, Well, I want you to be a prayer warrior. Here I am, Lord. Don't know a great amount of prayer language, but whatever you birth in my spirit, I'm going to pray. Lord, my citizen, I want you to be encouraging. Encourage this category of people. Encourage that category of people. Well, Lord, I don't have a lot of words, but I, I do know that I'll say, I prayed for you this week. Amen. Then God would want you to be a host of other things. The thing is, he's looking for full surrender. He's looking for full surrender. He said, here I am I. Send me. Send me. How many of us are prepared? And I say, well, here I am. Here I am. I don't know how big the box is that you want me to operate in. I don't know how big a field you're going to allow me to bring your, your, your grace to and your mercy to and, and your heart to. But here I am, Lord. Here I am. Whatever you want me to do, I am available to you. But before we can do that, we need an encounter with God. We need to encounter with God. We need, we need to be bold enough to say, God, convict me. I've had to pray that prayer many, many, many times. It's not an easy prayer to pray. And it's a harder prayer to believe for. And when God does convict me, I try to, I try to excuse it away. Do you know what I mean? Until I realize what God is doing. And I then put my hand up and say, God, whatever it is. Whatever the surrender is. Whatever the surrender is. Lord, prepare me. Prepare me. Prepare me. God had to prepare Isaiah with a live coal from where we all He was revolutionized. And he spent the rest of his life proclaiming the prophetic word of God. Prophecies of the other are being fulfilled today. Particularly the ones concerning the nation of Israel are being prepared today. Are happening today. Because God was allowed to use them. Church, the pastor's heart today is that we might have an encounter with God. That God will convict our hearts. And sometimes we think of conviction, we think of sin, not necessarily. He convicts us of what he wants us to do. He, he persuades us and shows us, and we respond to that conviction by saying yes. How many of the night would be so bold as to say, Lord, prepare me for what you want me to do in your life? How many, how many? How many would be so bold as I say, God, I have received much. Now, with your enabling spirit, I want to give out. How many would be prepared to say, Lord, when we come together, I want to encounter you so that I can dispense to others of the presence and the grace and the goodness of God that I have received. That's what Isaiah went and did. 
He declared God's love and God's mercy and God's patience and God's judgment. But he went to the people and he declared God. I'm going to do that. To say, Lord, prepare me. Well, that's a big, that's a big invitation. It means the Lord might have to pair away some things. He'd take out his, his, his knife and, 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 and pair off some things. Then take out the, 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 the sandpaper and, and, and sand down our lives, sand down our minds, sand down our, our favorite habits, sand down all of those things. And then even have to, 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 to wax it. And then have to buff it. And then have to rebuff it. And, and prepare our hearts to hear what he wants us to hear and to be what he wants us to be. That's what it's all about. Ask the mitchell come on back. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Pure and holy, tried and true. God said if we would prepare ourselves in His presence, His people, He would heal our land. The key to the healing of our city's violence and the key to the healing of the dysfunction in our families, the key to the healing of the things that, that, that are going on, which are, are repulsive to the Lord, is a church, a people of God, that is yielded to the Lord, who says, Lord, here we are. In our, in our failures, in our shortcomings, here we are, Lord. Here we are in your presence. Would you prepare us to do so? 150 people, 175 people are here tonight. Supposedly everyone left, so Lord, we're completely in your hands. Lord, we're true with ritual, we're true with routine. Lord, we want to encounter you. When the body of Christ come together, we want to see your glory. We want our lives to be touched by your power. And we want to go forward as, as lives that are refreshed in the presence of God. Molded and shaped for the glory of God. Would you hear? Make yourself available to the Lord tonight. Would you? Would you? 100 people, 160, 150 adults in the night. Children, who say, Lord, here I am. Use me, Lord. And God begins to show us what He needs to clean up in our lives. Not just to show us, but then He comes and do it. Amen. And we go and do what God wants us to do. Imagine the revolution that will take in place in this audience, this conference. God was allowed to work in our lives the way He wants to. We come in, the presence of God's in the house. God's saints are flowing in the Spirit of God. Souls are being saved, bodies are being healed, God's being glorified. Relationships that are broken are going to be going to be mended. Family problems are going to disappear with the grace of God, the power of God, and the presence of God begins to move. It's a healing, not only of physical bodies, but of broken relationships and of minds and spirits uh, and, and salvation. That's what happens when the saints of God say, Here, Lord, here I am. Prepare me to be that kind of dwelling place as sanctuary for you. How many tonight would dare to say, God, Lord, prepare me. I want us to stand. Pastor Mitchell's going to lead us. We have plenty of time tonight. If you have a desire to do what Isaiah said, Here am I, Lord. I am not worthy, but here I am. Renovate me. Visit me. Convict me. Keep guide me. Lead me. Use me. Here I am. Out here I am. Here I am. Here I am. How many would step out? There's lots of room on this altar. How many just invite anyone? We're not looking for dramatics. We just want people who are sincere with God to say, God, here I am. I am just like Isaiah. I know you, but I want to see your glory. When I see your glory, I want to see my own shortcomings, my own ugliness, spiritually speaking. And Lord, I want you to touch me in my life so that I can be a sanctuary for your presence and for your glory. How will you prepare to say that? Bring when you come, bring your frustrations, bring your struggles, bring your situations, and give them to the Lord. Say, Lord, here I am. Use me. Purify me. Strengthen me. Visit me. Visit me. Visit me. Would you just step out boldly tonight? 
Saints of God, I'm asking us to really consider this talk from the Word of God tonight. That we are to prepare our hearts. Prepare our hearts. We're to prepare our hearts, amen, for what God wants to do in our lives. It's pleasing to the Lord. It is pleasing to the Lord to see this. This has not been a a, a, a big overwhelming service. It's just a simple thing of praying and praising. And I'm sharing the word just out of my heart before the Lord as to where he would, what he has prepared us to do and wants us to do. Lord, Lord prepare me. Lord, if there's an island need to be torn down, tear it down. 